Okay, hello everyone. I think we're going to start now. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the day. Um, Sophie's then going to give a few words and then we'll just get straight on with the first panel. Um, so I'm Matthew. I'm president of Liberate the Debate, uh, hosting this alongside the Free Speech Champions. Um, the event will start with a panel from 12.45, uh, although we're a little late, but uh, that's fine, um, going on till about 2 o'clock. Um, this is our first panel on academic freedom. Um, I'll let them all introduce themselves themselves. And then we'll have a 15 minute kind of transition at two o'clock um, into Jubilee 115, which is just across the hall, but we'll have the people in the white hoodies uh, leading you to the right place. Um, that'll then be just kind of discussion amongst ourselves on kind of tables of six-ish um, about free speech. There's a set of kind of prompts, but you don't have to stick exclusively to those. Uh, and then another kind of 30 minute break just to mingle amongst yourselves, grab a coffee, stuff like that. Um, and then we'll come back in here for the second panel of the day, uh, which is kind of all about the student experience uh, on campus. Um, I'd encourage you all during the panels to speak to the, the panellists, ask them questions, make points. You don't just have to sit there and listen. You, you, there'll be chances to engage as well. Um, and then we should be roughly wrapped up by about five o'clock, at which point we'll all head over to Farm Bar and grab a drink, and you're all welcome to come along to that. So. I'll let you Thank you. Can I second what Matthew said about interacting? Because I promise this isn't actually like a sneaky Saturday lecture we're inflicting on you or anything. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Sophie. I'm with the Free Speech Champions. I've been organising this in collaboration with um, Matthew. And I guess I just wanted to say a big welcome and a thank you to everyone for coming. Um, some of you have come from really quite far afield, like Warwick and Sheffield, We've got some Oxford, I think, somewhere in Cambridge. Um, and yeah, and those of you who have come from Sussex as well, it's great to see so many of you because I'm sure there are, there, you have your own challenges when it comes to being engaged with this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I think especially in this kind of era of Twitter hangouts and Zoom calls, it's great to have you all with us in person in, you know, in a room and I think it's interesting what we've seen over the last few months is the way that lecturers and academics and students interact a lot of the time and the way that students in express disagreement with academics is very one-sided. It's usually social media campaigns and posters in underpasses that won't be named and um, you know all of, all of the rest. And whether or not you agree with Kathleen Stock or Stephen Greer or Neil Finn or various other academics who've been monstered essentially over the last few months, I think what is really clear is that there's this lack of dialogue and, and kind of interplay and discussion between students and, and challenging views and the academics who espouse them. So, and that's, for me, that's what I think university is supposed to be all about. So it's just, it's fantastic to have you all here in person. And that wouldn't be possible without Sussex um, sort of slaving away, filling in risk assessments <laughs> and <laughs> battling the SU over the last few weeks to get us this nice room to to have that conversation. Um, so yeah, big thank you to you as well. And um, the only other thing I have to say quickly is that the Free Speech Champions have various projects going on that it would be lovely to get some more of you involved with if you're, if you're up for it. And one of the, I'll just mention one quickly so we can get on with the panel, and that's um, our magazine, The New Taboo. It's print and online, and we're currently accepting submissions until the end of December on the theme of autonomy. If you have any other writing that Kind of could do with finding a home, then get in touch with us anyway because we've got various other platforms and places that we publish things and have these conversations. So, yeah, I'll stop talking now and let you get on with it. But um, thank you so much for coming. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sophie, and thanks to Matthew. I, I really do think that Liberate the Debate and Free Speech Champions are to, uh, should get huge congratulations for being prepared to put on a day like this. I think it's genuinely impressive that uh, you have uh, made the effort to put it on and I know you've jumped through hoops to, to, to do it. Um, but really, uh, congratulations for having the, the uh, bravery, I think, uh, because we do live in an era of culture wars, which is obviously a very divisive era. We live in the era where uh, things like the Kathleen Stock situation has happened, which leads to a certain tension and protests and whatever. And so to take a decision uh, to actually not just go and counter protest, which you know, would have been relatively easy, but actually to gather people in a room for a discussion about free speech 
what it's all about, why it's important, why academic freedom is important. I think it's a very, very important move uh, in, in today's climate. So thanks to everyone who's come along uh, uh, to engage in that discussion. And we're going to, as Matthew's hinted and Sophie have hinted at, uh, use a format in, in, the, in these discussions, which is very much uh, short introductions at the start of, of the panel. I'll give them probably five minutes to uh, make a few introductory remarks. But then it really is over to you uh, for your contributions, whether that be points that you want to take up uh, in response to things that have been said from the panel, questions, anything really. Uh, this is the opportunity to raise these things. And I think uh, uh, as much as the culture wars and free speech issues seem like black and white issues, I can tell you they're a lot more complicated than that. And I think we should uh, recognise that and be prepared to use uh, to, to, to raise uh, this, use this opportunity to raise very difficult issues. And really, uh, it's a duty on all of us, I think, to, to leave this room at five o'clock or whatever with a much better understanding of what all the issues are around, because we've dared to ask the right questions. And even if they seem, you know, slightly ridiculous questions, you could be pretty sure that someone else in the room is probably thinking the same thing. So do use it as an opportunity uh, to get stuck into the discussion. Uh, as they've said, uh, the, the, the sessions to follow will give an opportunity for groups to break down and kind of look at free speech issues in student spaces in a bit more detail. Then the final panel will be on how do we debate better. So we wanted to use this opening session to look at the issues of academic freedom and free speech, which are very, obviously very much in the news over uh, uh, the recent months, not least because there's a bill going through Parliament just now, uh, which is... Uh, has the ambition of promoting free speech within the universities. But academic freedom and free speech are terms that are used very often, but I think far too seldom are they delved into in, in an attempt to really understand what they mean in the context of university life. And I'd really like to use this panel as an opportunity to look at what academic freedom and free speech are, what they mean, uh, why they're so important for university life, how far should we take them, because, you know, do we just end up with a free-for-all situation within universities? Uh, universities which are meant to be kind of about knowledge. Uh, do we risk diminishing that kind of truth-seeking knowledge role within universities? And can they be legislated for? Uh, can free speech and academic freedom be legislated for? I think it's a big question, you know, as to how this bill is, 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 is going to either aid or possibly hinder the cause of academic freedom and, and free speech. So these are some of the things that we can look at. You no doubt will have loads of other questions that I've not mentioned. Um, so let me introduce uh, our three speakers uh, in the order they're going to speak. So first up on my right hand side is Dennis Hayes, who's Emeritus Professor of Education at the University of Derby. He's come down from Derby today. There's probably only one thing that's more broken in the free speech culture in the UK is the British transport system. Hence why he's come in uh, two minutes, two minutes to spare. Um, Dennis is is a founder of, uh, and I'm going to hold it up because you can speak to him afterwards and find out a bit more about this organisation that he founded called Academics for Academic Freedom. He's an author and editor of many books. Uh, two I want to mention. The Dangerous Rise of Therapeutic Education, which he wrote with Catherine Eccleston about 10, 20 years ago now, probably, 10, 10, ten years ago, uh, which is, is uh, an incredibly important book and, and, and recognised as, as, as such. And he's just now working on a book called The, the Death of Academic Freedom, Free Speech and Censorship on uh, Campus, which I think is out next year. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so welcome to you, Dennis. Uh, sec uh, second uh, on my left is uh, Arif Ahmed, who's a reader in philosophy at the University of Cambridge. He's also worked at Birmingham University, held positions at Pisa, Sydney and MIT. And also you spent a while here, didn't yep. you? Uh, yep. as has just been revealed to me over coffee. Um, he's uh, uh, a very notable and important, I think, campaigner for free speech within universities. Uh, he's done lots of work at Cambridge to promote the cause of free speech, including resisting some of the measures uh, that have been attempted to be introduced uh, there. He's a writer, you find him in the Daily Telegraph and other publications, and he's got a couple of books coming up out as well, Evidential Decision Theory and the Value of the Future. Uh, so welcome to you, Eric, and thanks for coming down from Cambridge. And finally, uh, we've got Ella Whelan, uh, who's a journalist, and you find her in 
numerous uh, publications, The Critic, The New Statesman, The Telegraph being just three. She's a columnist for Spiked and she's also one third of the team at Spiked that does uh, their weekly uh, uh, podcast. She's the author of What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and an End to Feminism. She's one half of Lobster Films, a production company. Uh, that makes uh, political documentaries. And finally, but certainly not least, she's the co-convener of the Battle of Ideas Festival, uh, which is run by the Academy of Ideas, and which takes place annually. Uh, and I work on that festival as well. And mm -hmm. Ella is uh, uh, a huge asset in terms of uh, both through her journalism and all the other things she does, but especially the Battle of Ideas Festival, just promoting debate within this country. So, without further ado, Dennis, do you want to give us kind of five minutes of thoughts uh, and then we'll move on. Alistair, I'd like to thank you for organising this because you're doing what academics should be doing. And I noticed a sort of change <coughs> in universities from, and actually dated from Thursday the 26th of October, time 7pm at Warwick University, where I was on a panel discussing this house regrets no platforming policies in universities, which narrowly was one, so that they regretted it. But after that um, session, lots of students came up and said, we want to start free speech societies. How do we do it? What can we do? And since then, that's what started to happen. Not just liberate the debate, but Bristol Free Speech Society, Kent Free Speech Society. It went on. There was even Derby had one called Get Off the Fence. And students spontaneously started setting up groups to talk about free speech issues and to no platform, to re-platform people who be platformed. That was a really healthy development. Most recently, of course, the formation of and the Free Speech Champions is a great networking opportunity and a spin-off from that is the Open University of Free Speech um, Society just before. So it's a great moment. That said, I just thought I would raise three um, issues for you to think about rather than do um, a tub thumping at attack on the therapeutic culture, which is what I normally do in university and say, you know, you're all snowflakes and like this. It's not, um, it's not my line, by the way. But, so, the first thing I w want to address is this question that you have in your blurb about the meaning of academic freedom. And you know, when you get to questions of semantics, I think Arif and perhaps me as well could have a good discussion about the nature of definitions and Wittgenstein's um, family resemblance metaphor. It's going to arguably Wittgenstein did away with that search for a definition. So we're not talking about um, a meaning. We're not getting involved in questions of meaning, but trying to identify a problem. Now I'm going to say what I think that problem is by reference to um, the University and College Union, you know, the largest higher education um, union in the world, of which I was the first um, joint president. And uh, even then, I you know, got in trouble over academic freedom issues. They responded to the formation of AFAF by producing their own policy. They actually did a survey with academics to what they thought, and they really supported our, you know, basically, um, absolutists for your free speech in universities. That was um, then qualified by all the equalities and statements they added on to it. But UCU are quite unique in that they don't support free speech. One of the things that you find about academics, they're really keen on academic freedom, as far as it's freedom to teach, freedom to research, you know, freedom to design your own curriculum. But the aspect of academic freedom they dislike is free speech. And why the UCU is important, they did a survey in 2017, Terence Karen headed it up from the University of Lincoln. And um, they found that I think it was 81% of academics wanted more information about academic freedom. 81% wanted more information about academic freedom. But the problem with it is, and the problem with UCU's position, that it's something you might like um, to discuss, is they only defend the free speech of people they agree with. So Joe Grady wouldn't defend the free speech of Kathleen Stock. They're actually quite quiet on David Miller, surprisingly, because he's a person they will support. But they will support people that, um, that, who, that the Jews they agree with. And that's an issue that, you know, is that what you're about as liberals? Do you only support liberal views or do you support the right of people to preach hate, for instance? Or Holocaust denial? Is it only if there's acceptable views, even acceptable to you, that you allow? to be expressed or not, but very clearly, you know, the lead body for academics does not believe that certain issues are up for discussion. I mean, the leadership think that free speech is a fascist conspiracy. So you're all part of the fascist conspiracy, at least instead of what is the news concern. So that's, um, what's important about free speech is academics often get it wrong, because they think that all their job is to do research, and when you do research, then you can say something. 
But Christopher Lash, in a very good book I recommend it to you, um, called The Revolt of the Elites and the Betrayal of, the, of Democracy, was published in 1996, it was a posthumous book. He yeah, has some excellent um, articles in there. One is about the illusion of academic subversions, well, some quite interesting things. But talking about debate, he says this, I'll, I'll try and read it slowly, I always read too fast. <clears throat> what democracy requires is vigorous public debate, not information. Of course it needs information too, but the kind of information it needs can be generated only by debate. We do not know what we need to know until we ask the right questions. And we can identify the right questions only by subjecting our own ideas about the world to the test of public controversy. Information, this is the important point, information usually seen as the precondition of debate is better understood as its byproduct. When we get into arguments that focus and, and fully engage our attention, we become avid seekers of relevant information. Otherwise, we take in information passively if we take it in at all. So there's a great twist that goes on in academia because free speech comes first, if you like, then the research. I see it as a continuum. And I think, but you're getting the wrong way around, as if you're not allowed to speak unless you've done the research. And that's in the Higher Education Act because unless it's amended, and there's an amendment that changes this, it restricts academic freedom to um, academics' field of expertise. So that you can only talk about the research you've done, you can't talk about anything else. And I think so that's something you should discuss. Whether is, is debate prior to research, or do you need to do the research and then hope? I can give you some examples, by the way. It, isn't, it is prior. <clears throat> so that's one issue about debate. But the, the issue I also want to raise is that comes up all the time in these debates, and it, it, it comes up, it came up when Ellen and I were debating uh, like two weeks ago. And that's the, the horny old question of shouting fire in a crowded theatre. Who come across this thing? Free speech does not go as far. It's from Schneck um, versus um, the United States in 1919. It's worth knowing it so you know where it all comes from. Where Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Supreme Court Justice, upheld a conviction of Schneck for campaigning against the draft. And he said this, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in in falsely shouting fire in a theatre and causing a panic. Right? Falsely shouting fire in a theatre and causing a panic. And the interesting thing about that judgment is the last bit, and causing a panic. It's what it tells you, what they th the judges and what a lot of people think about human beings. That when people speak, it causes a panic. That somehow you're so easy to influence that you will panic and do something disastrous. So that's one of the main reasons for censorship. But you know, that judgment has subsequently been overturned. And just to remind you of one other one that's always good to remember. Whitney versus California in 1927, with a famous um, judgment against um, a communist who was um, arguing for the violent overthrow of the American government. Okay. And she, um, uh, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis said this, the remedy, the remedy to be applied to this sort of speech is more speech, not enforced silence. Only an emergency can justify such repression. Such must be the rule if authority is to be reconciled with freedom. Such, in my opinion, is the command of the Constitution. It has been always open to Americans to challenge the law, abridging free speech and assembly, by showing that there was no emergency justifying it. So all the debates is you can't say this because there's an emergency. At the bottom of the opening page of On Liberty, chapter two, and I think um, Mill points this out that you know, there was an emergency as he was writing the book that um, led to the suppression of thought. So that the Brandeis judgment is very good. So when you know what, how hateful the speech is, the response is not to suppress it, but to um, actually go in for more speech. Yeah. So I mean, the, what that, that last thing t t tells you, those two judgments are interesting because. They don't, a lot of people don't believe that human beings are capable of responding rationally to any judgment. So that when somebody says something, you respond emotionally rather than rationally. That's not my view of people. I, I think that 
no matter what, what, who's ever on the platform, it's not about us, it's about you. You make the judgment yourselves, you can think for yourselves. So there's a lot of people think that you can't, and that diminished view of human beings is to, to, the background of a lot of these debates. But I'll leave it there and we can discuss those issues. Okay, thank you. Arif, your thoughts. Great, thank you very much. First, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, for those really interesting thoughts. There's much that I agree with in that. Um, and thank you very much to all of you for being here. I would echo everything that Dennis said about that. It's great to see you all here. Um, and it's great that you're taking this initiative. Um, particularly after what's happened in Sussex, I would like to hear from all of you about your views on that, but from the outside world, to the outside world, it looks like an absolute disaster. That what has happened is that after years of victimization and harassment, a university academic who was saying things that were perfectly legal and many people think are in fact true, was forced out of her position. Um, the blame for that, I think, lies largely not with the students who have a right to protest, but with a small number of people who were victimising her and intimidating her, and also with the university authorities. Um, an instructive contrast, I think, could be drawn with the University of Chicago. So about a year ago, there was an academic in Chicago called Dorian Abbott, who was, who was, he was you know, he released videos of things arguing against affirmative action and arguing for for hiring on merit rather than based on, on, on race and, and sex and so on, or gender. Um, and there were letters circulated, people wanted him fired, a letter circulated saying he makes people of, of you know, minorities feel unwelcome and unsafe at that university. The president of the university issued a statement very quickly saying that Chicago's free speech policy means that there's no, the university places no restriction on what faculty members say and it will not punish and it will not mandate apologies from any faculty member for saying what they think under any circumstances. Sussex authorities could have done that years ago. Um, they did nothing and by their inaction I believe they encouraged what has happened so that we got to the point where it's, it is frankly a disgrace that we've seen this occur. Um, that's how it looks to the outside world. I know that the IFS has launched an inquiry and it may be that further facts come to light but at present the situation seems as I have described to many people outside of Sussex. Alistair asked me to say a bit about academic freedom and uh, free speech, to say a bit about uh, uh, how, it, how it relates to, to the bill, if, if possible, and various other things. Much of what I say is, in, is consistent with, with Dennis's remarks, but there is a difference of emphasis. Um, first of all, I'll say a bit about what I understand the difference between academic freedom and free speech to be. Broadly speaking, academic freedom means the liberty of academics, you know, university lectures and so on, to pursue areas of research as they wish, to publish as they wish and so on, in their areas of expertise. Free speech is much broader and it means that you can pretty much say what you like. Um, in universities, usually it means you can say what you like within the law, but of course, you might think the law itself is overly restricted. The bill, as it's described, does make a distinction between these things. So the bill that the government is trying to push through says that academics have the freedom to pursue research and, and write within their area of expertise. Like Dennis, I think that that's too restrictive and dangerous, but the reasons might be slightly different. Um, I think a large part of the freedom that matters at university is the freedom to discuss ideas that are half-baked and things that you don't know much about and areas that are of interest to you that are not your area of expertise. That applies to academics, of course. So, for instance, a lot of academic progress comes from people writing about areas that are not their area of expertise, but about other disciplines. But it also applies to students, perhaps more to students. That when you're at university, you ought to be free to explore all kinds of positions and talk about and discuss all kinds of things which are wrong or extreme or half-baked or you don't know whether they might be true. But if you can't discuss them, you'll never have any idea whether they're true or not. A distinct point is that in many of these areas, excuse me, I don't think John Stuart Mill's defence of free speech applies. John Stuart Mill's defence was that free speech is conducive to finding the truth about a matter, but there are many questions where there simply isn't a right or wrong answer. Um, this is based on the distinction that Hume, David Hume drew between facts and values. So there are questions which are matters of fact and which we can settle. There are other questions which are matters of values which we cannot settle because there is no answer. If we think about trade-offs, and most genuine moral questions involve trade-offs between competing values, and there's no answer to how we should trade them off. At what rate should we trade off, for instance, 
damage caused by climate change in the future against damage caused by um, suppressing economic growth in the present? There is no right answer to that question. And anyone who says there is, and that you've got it wrong, is making something up. It's a matter of choosing your own trade-offs, and that's based on choosing your own values. And so in that area, it's not a question of free speech is conducive towards finding the truth, because there is no truth. It's a matter of working out for yourself what you think is right and what you care about. But these are, these are questions of value. These are not questions of fact. So whilst I think there is a limit to the sort of John Stuart Millian, the million defense of free speech, um, I think there are other defenses which can apply in these areas. And that really is part of the reason why I think it's so important to defend free speech and not just academic freedom in universities. Because um, we, had, we had Jordan Peterson over at Cambridge last, last couple of weeks ago. Um, it, was a, it was a very important visit for various reasons. One of the things he said in one of his talks, which I think was quite right, is that there isn't really an important distinction between what you can say and what you can think. And freedom of speech ultimately means freedom to be able to think things through for yourself. Um, and that's essential to what it is to be an individual. It's not just a matter of finding the truth or something, you know, academic success. It's a matter of being an individual person rather than being in the control of whatever ideology happens to be dominant in this country at the time. So ultimately, you are all individuals. You all have to think for yourself and make your mind up about things. And it's the freedom to protect that, I think, that is at the core of what a university should be for and really what we are fighting for. So thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Lots of useful stuff in there, I think, that we need to come back to and just see how far you push some of these, mm -hmm. these, these things. But Ella, let's have your thoughts first, and then we can get into the discussion. Okay, thanks, Alistair. Um, as Dennis and Arif have already explained, the difference between academic freedom and free speech, um, and it's important to point that out, because as Alistair says, they kind of get jumbled up together and people use them interchangeably. Um, but I want to suggest that this, the difference between them has, I think that probably as Dennis has alluded to, has certainly among academics created a kind of, among certain academics created a kind of um, prissy attitude really, which is that academic freedom is this thing that a very small group of people should be able to have and that pursuing, you know, the distinctions that Dennis made about the difference between research and debate that it should be something that's shielded and separate. Um, I mean, obviously, in, we understand that the reason why a university is important is a bit like a scientist doing experiments in a lab. There are certain areas of life where you give someone a special amount of license or resources, as you do at a university, time and space and um, money and books to think about things that you wouldn't, or try out things that you wouldn't necessarily do in the street or in the pub or in your own home. And that applies to ideas as well. But I think that the the distinction between academic freedom and free speech and that kind of siphoning off of, um, of free speech, particularly on a university campus, as somehow completely distinct and bordered away from the rest of normal life has become a bit of a problem. I think university, the discussion about free speech on campus uh, has been treated for too long like campus is this bubble that is in kind of pregnable, uh, you can't cross it into the, when you cross over the boundaries of a campus you move away from normal life and you move, move away from the outside world I think that's become a problem because campus censorship um, and, and campus cancel culture the, uh, the reasons why it happens and the focus on it for me has always been misplaced um, and I think it has always pushed, pushed that division too far the higher education bill I am um, and maybe we can get into this in the discussion I don't just have a problem with it on the basis of it being limited in terms of what it says about expertise. Um, I have a problem fundamentally with the idea that a, uh, a place and a space in life of a university um, should be begging for its free speech from a government, that it should be the state that legislates the basis and the parameters of what people can say you know, out in life, whether that be in Jubilee 144 or down the road uh, in Brighton out on the street. I think that that fundamentally is a problem and tells us something about the desperate nature of um, the discussion about campus culture that we're looking to um, conservative government to be able, or any, you know, any kind of government to give us the, get, the go ahead and the green light to be able to say certain things. But I think this is probably indicative of a wider problem of the siphoning off of university life and university education as separate from uh, 
real life from you know when you're when you're a teenager at school when you leave university and you're a person out in the world of work it strikes me as not unsurprising as you know that students who make claims about being particularly offended at a university you know this whole idea you know in relation to Sussex here that people would be so offended by what Kathleen Stock had to say on gender or sex or whatever that it would make them feel physically and emotionally and personally threatened I mean that just would not wash that kind of crap out in you know, if you said that to your friends in the street, if you said that out in your workplace in the office, it just, it, you know, lots of it just wouldn't wash. It doesn't pass the kind of pub test. And I think that tells you something about the way in which university life has been made very separate and very special and problematically um, kind of bubbled outside of, away from the kind of the pressures and the expectations of normal life. Because campus, you know, people talk about the, you know, we've often used the phrase campus culture and how do you deal with the fact of how do you fight back against council culture. And for me, the really important word in all of that is culture, is that you cannot just bring in a piece of legislation that provides certain protections to certain people or threatens legal action if you cross the line of, of censorship or whatever it is, completely negates the fact that it, the issue of cancel culture is that it is a culture, it's a complicated one. It's a mix, a heady mix of things like a, and uh, maybe Dennis can talk more about this, a more easily offended um, generation who have been more um, susceptible to the ideas of, you know, not quite snowflakery, but a kind of therapeutic sense of the, the whole of your life has to affirm your identity and any kind of thing that brings that into contention, any... Um, different views is going to hurt not just your view of the world but your soul and your very being. A more cowardly political elite that doesn't really um, believe in freedom anymore if it ever did and very few people actually say, you know, saying you are a free speech absolutist is like saying you're some you're kind of heinous witch. Um, but also, and I think this is most important for discussions about academia, you know, an, an academia that has completely lost faith in its own authority. I mean as I said I think the problem with what happened with Kathleen Stock on campus isn't necessarily um, just the posters that went up in the tunnel along Falmer. I mean, I was a student here from 2010 to 2014, and uh, we had some hairy posters up in that tunnel. In fact, I probably put a few of them up myself, <laughs> not uh, in relation to gender and sex, but I mean, we used to, you, I think it was not I didn't do it, but we chased an MP off with turnips off campus one time. I mean, there was a, there was a kind of a, I don't think it's students do student stuff all the time, right? But the problem wasn't that, it was the fact that very few people across um, the university working in academia, either the staff in the administration or indeed her fellow peers who were professors and lecturers, none of them realised that whether or not they uh, agreed with Stock's particular view of gender and sex, that, you know, that the, the issue of acad her academic freedom and free speech could quite easily come for them tomorrow. No one, there was no solidarity in relation to what a um, professor should be allowed to do and say. There was really no, there was a complete, uh, you know, a lack of bravery within the staff, which I think is far more problematic than a couple of, um, or, you know, 20 or so blue-haired people shouting stuff and putting up silly posters. Um, and that, you know, there's always going to be people on the extremes but we have to look at the inability of academics to stand up for their own position as um, people in authority. And just the last point, I think that I think we've probably given too much ground to the idea that free speech is this very special and specific thing. And Dennis mentioned the point of Lash and the relationship between free speech and democracy. I mean, just to now have a pop at academics, I think it's telling that during the Brexit referendum, you had so many um, people working in universities in support of uh, staying in the European Union, which is fine, that's a, position, that's a reasonable position to take, but the resistance and the de you know, degradation and demonization of the Brexit vote among academics tells you something about the, um, if I was being really nasty, snobby attitude to the, the way in which free speech, what it means, and what it means to think of yourself as this very special um, little institution that can deal with handling ideas and can deal with uh, hashing out difficult debates but once you take that outside the walls of the university or even outside the walls of your department into uh, a seminar room with your students that that becomes somehow problematic and impossible because these people who don't have the expertise can't handle ideas. I think that everything's gotten a little bit too safe. I think that if you, you know, it's a bit like waiting for Boris Johnson to give you the green light to have your Christmas party um, mm -hmm. under coronavirus restrictions. I think 
students and academics have to stop waiting for the green light from their vice chancellors. You have to stop uh, waiting for, you know, I understand there are practical reasons of dealing with how to get a room at a university, but I know what Sussex SU was like. I battled them for four years. And at some point, you're going to have to start saying, um, we're not going to take no for an answer. And that will come with its trials and its um, difficulties. As Alice has mentioned, it's not, you know, we are not dealing with a kind of airy-fairy world of campus culture. It's vicious. People <coughs> lose their jobs. People um, get treated very badly online. But if you're going to wait for a defunct union, as the SU is, or a vice chancellor, or indeed a government minister, to give you the green light to speak, then I think you don't really believe in the power of free speech. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'm going to give you the green light to ask anything that you want, or say anything that you want. Um, so we should so feel free to pick up on anything that's been said so far, or feel free to uh, bring some of your own experiences on, on, on this particular campus, or as, be, as a student more generally. Uh, ask questions on anything that you need or want to. Um, we'll take a group of questions, then I'll come back and pick up, you know, we can pick up a few of the questions uh, and then back and forth uh, for the next half an hour or so. So, uh, yes, do you, uh, right at the back there, then I'll come down to you and then I'll come over to you. Um, so I guess my general question is sort of related to the whole sort of like talk, is like, what do you think has kind of facilitated this cause, or like this change that like, you know, progressive, let's say in the 60s or the 70s, you know, it feels like protests on the Vietnam War, and then you get like thousands and thousands of marching, protesting, and it seems like a real desire for people to actually want to have that conversation, to want to engage with the other side. Whereas now, like people who I guess if you call them aggressive, they'll have like similar sort of causes, but there's almost like an avoidance to actually want to talk about the issue. But I guess my question is, what is the main reason for that change, and how do we stop it? Okay, very useful. Um, yes. So this is slightly two sides, and Ella touched on this a little bit earlier. Talking about the university and its administration, and I can't claim to be too knowledgeable over the last 50 years, but would I be right in saying that there are more monetary interests, universities are more uh, closer to businesses in certain aspects rather than being purely academic institutions? How do you think academic institutions should consider this monetary balance when elements like freedom of speech is not necessarily uh, well, you have fallouts like caffeine stock, and I can't imagine that does any favours for the administration on top there. Now, the second part is, is there's one side, and this is something that we'd all advocate for, which is universities should be a place of academic inquiry and so forth. Now, over the last few years, increasingly the argument has been placed about, you know, campus should be uh, more safe so students can freely pursue their academic interests. Um, and the like in the way that they see fit so they can get their degree and, and move on with the rest of their life. And the reason why I, I take that second point is because it also ties with the university's overall of just giving people degrees. Because there's a lot of people where they're going to go to university because they just need to get the degree to get to the next step rather than the holistic academic freedom. Okay, thank you very much. And yes? Um, I was just wondering about how, because Ella touched on kind of um, universities and bishops and giving people the green light. Um, so I'm at Cambridge University and technically we have been given the free light. There was um, the Regents House Amendment a couple of years ago now I think that basically defended free speech of this sort. But kind of that feels very, very disconnected from the culture at Cambridge. I mean it's absolutely terrifying to have a view that doesn't conform and I don't really know how that is kind of reconciled with student culture or even kind of individual college culture. Um, so kind of, I think it's not as easy as well. We just need the green light. We just need policies that kind of, you know, allow for freedom of discussion. Because I think those already exist, and um, certainly exist at my university. But that is kind of so different from what actually happens on a day-to-day -day basis and how you're treated and how it feels to have a different kind of view. Because I think a lot of people in here can relate to this. A really scary thing to kind of just speak out and kind of keep, you're not necessarily afforded protection even if it's kind of written in university policy. Okay, let, so let me just come back for some very quick thoughts and then I'll come back out again. But Dennis, on this, this point of change, do you, do you want to pick that up? I know you've written a book on therapeutic education. I don't know if that's relevant in any way, but if you wanted to kind of say yeah. what that is. I think a lot of things connect. The question about managerialism as well, but it's what, um, 
I've written up on the back of organisation of higher education and um, how all these bureaucratic structures have got into place to get more students through, it doesn't matter what you're doing to get through. But how did they get away with that? And it's something I discovered in a, a teacher training class because they were, they were in teacher training for um, higher education. You had to meet certain targets, so you had objectives, they were ruthless. But it was all done in a touchy-feely way, sort of loving, loving your student. You used to literally come up and hug, thank the lecturer. And so th there's that sort of humanistic, they used to call it, a sort of therapeutic atmosphere, but it's actually just getting you to meet the objectives. So I think that what the big shift was, and I would say, um, that, and it's two of things to say, but I mean, in Valentine's Day 1989 is the key date. What happened on Valentine's Day 1989? Not, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me, a lot of people got Valentine's cards, yes. <laughs> no, it, it was the um, fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Well, you know, and that, that, that is the crux where things started to change because for publishing the satanic verses, you know, he was under threat of death, people were killed, businesses were bombed. But Penguin stuck to publishing the book. Right? And I think and, you know, many people have written about this. So basically, since that time, people have internalised the fatwa. The idea of giving offence to anybody about anything has just become the norm. It's part of the culture. That's why it's a therapeutic culture, in that you must not give emotional offence to anyone. That's the culture we're working in, so it's not something that you can just change by a policy. The idea that you must never give anybody any offence. But just to make one point about offence, when you present yourself as a victim, right, and you say, I've been offended, it doesn't make you weak, it's not a snowflake thing, it makes you really strong. Because who can challenge a victim? You know, why is TV full of people crying all the time? And, and saying they've been hurt and harmed because he cannot be challenged. Now, whatever it is you challenge, whether there's any basis to it or not, it makes you invulnerable to criticism. And that's, that's the sort of shift that's happened. And along with that has come the idea that because people get hurt or say, claim they've been hurt, they take offence, emotional offence, then they must never be challenged. So, so that's why you see you will not engage in any debate because it's too damaging to people's individual emotional selves. Their, in, their individuality. I don't think that's true, but that's the climate we're in, and challenging it is very difficult. So if you try and challenge it, because the relationship everybody has is therapy to victims, T2V is a nice little phrase. You're a therapist, or you're a victim, or you're a victimizer. That's basically the way it goes. So it's really hard to challenge people when the I mean, just when the book came out, we, we, we showed what was going on in primary schools, lots and lots of examples to show the cultural change. And some parents cried because they felt that their children need, so when you're in the audience putting in an argument for they're crying because they feel that their children need this um, therapeutic mock, mock therapeutic activity, like circle time. You all came up with it, do you want an example in your own heads? Circle time, sit in a small group and discuss. Right? That happens to every, every level, I'm sure we get it in university management sessions. You know, break up, don't have a public session like this, but break up into small groups and talk to yourselves. It seemed to be empowering, but it actually takes all the powers away. Because the only way you actually achieve anything, either to understand your own ideas or to have them challenged, is to put them into the public realm, just as Lash says. You know, otherwise, you know, you're just going through a therapeutic activity that makes you feel good. That has no purpose. Okay, fine. Um, when we come back out, I mean, uh, Dennis says there's a kind of victim mentality. Presumably no one in here thinks that they have a victim mentality, because no one ever does think that they have a victim mentality. So kind of be good to unpick what that means a little bit, because that's a bit of an assertion that you might want to challenge uh, uh, Dennis on that. Um, Arif, I mean, pick up uh, whatever you want, but one thing possibly you might want to do is to respond to some of the points that Ella was making, because in, in your remarks you, you talked about the university authorities and the protesters as part of the problem in this instance with the Kathleen Stock situation. Um, Ella seems to be saying that there's a more kind of fundamental loss of mission within the academy more broadly and particularly uh, given that no one's really spoke up for Kathleen Stock in yeah. Sussex amongst her immediate close fellow academics. Yeah. So is there a kind of 
is this change that people are asking about kind of a, a, a product of a sense of loss of mission from uh, within the academy or is it kind of uh, more reflective of a broader kind of cultural political shift? It's probably got to do with a number of things, but what Anna mentions is clearly one of them, and that ties in with the second second question, actually, because I think that many people at universities who work at universities don't know what a university is, and they don't really want to be at a university, because a university is not, or it should not be, just a place where you pay a bit of money, get a degree, and then go off and get a job. A university should be a place where you can discuss things that are shocking and disturbing and offensive, but have your ideas shaken up, and discuss these things completely freely. And academics, as much as students, perhaps more than students, have now, you know, think of their role in a much more professional and narrow way. So they think, well, you know, you just pay your money, you go and get your degree, and then you go off, and, and that's it. So I think that is part, that change in attitude is part of why academics themselves are not concerned to speak up for their colleagues. Because it's not their job, you know, why should they? And that, in turn, is a reflection of the increased managerialism and commercialisation of the, of, the, of the HE sector. But is there not a basic sort of sense of solidarity amongst that? Well, kind of evidently thing. not in Sussex. Um, <laughs> and evidently not in Cambridge either. I mean, there's a, somebody, somebody spoke very eloquently about what happens in, in Cambridge, and that's quite right. And it's true amongst the academics as well. There is no solidarity between, mm -hmm. you know, some, someone who got into trouble for saying something about, I don't know, climate change or immigration or something. Most of the academics wouldn't support them. Though many of them, not because they, they, they don't agree with, with freedom of speech, because they're afraid to, actually. Or because they think it's not their job, or not their duty. Um, so those are both, both, both definitely parts of the problem. Okay, Ella, again, pick, sort of pick up on anything you want, but I, I suppose the challenge that might be thrown at you would be, are you not um, under-assessing the kind of depth of some of the sort of cultural shifts that have taken place? So, and uh, is there not a case that, that uh, something like an academic freedom bill, on a, just on a basic level of raising concerns and raising the flag for uh, open more open culture <coughs> discussion within universities, is that not something at the, at the very least that's worth celebrating or at least recognising in a positive sense? I think it's completely understandable why it's come about and I have every sympathy with um, anyone who wants to do something about this but I just think you have to be quite clear on where the, I think the emphasis on it being a top-down approach of, a, of government legislation is as a means to fix this completely misses the fundamental point of where the issue of censorship happens. So, you know, it, here at Sussex, the, the university does not have um, particular rules that say that you that like, you're going to get fired. There's no, there, there is kind of no authoritarian top-down official that's pretty dodgy as Dennis's policies that can be um, interpreted in certain ways. Whether it be, you know, when I was here, you used to have zero tolerance to harassment, which was framed as a kind of let's be nice to women thing, but actually meant that it, you could ban speakers on the basis of it. There's, so there's that, but there's there's. It's not like the university says, you know, oh, don't say that. And yet academics didn't come out and defend Kathleen Stock or others. And so then you have to say this isn't a problem of just you're following the wrong policy. It's a it's a much bigger, more I think it's a it's a much more bottom up issue of people not grasping where the problem of and where the future of campus um, culture is going to go. Because I think it picks up on what you meant, what you said about Cambridge and about speaking out. Uh, you know, I, it links in with the university as businesses um, sort of issue, which is that I think part of the problem is that we have, you know, and this is where I'm going to throw it much broader, it's a much broader political issue, but you have a broader problem in society of alienation and people less and less talking to each other, you know, whether that be issues of, on, you know, online or people ask questions of why can't we debate properly anymore. A lot of it is because the fundamental nature of us being sociable and talking to each other has been diminished. It's been diminished very radically in the last 20 months with the pandemic, but before then, you know, university life today is not the same as it was in, in 1981, or it wasn't the same as it was in the 60s. It has changed, partly because university, you, know, you have this kind of funding of you go to university, you get your degree, maybe you get pissed a few times in Falmer Bar, maybe you join the hockey club, but generally you're not going to do, you're, you're, you have your friends and you go through, and actually lots of students at the moment I've heard talking about the fact that they really don't like seminars, they like lectures, they want to just get the lecture, get the information, do your degree, and then you know go away to your um, job at the end of it. And that whole idea of, it's because we sometimes can sound quite 
um, outdated or almost sort of like idealistic by talking about the fact that university, you have these hungry students that come wanting to learn. I think the reality is a lot of that isn't true for young people. And so then when you come out and say what you think, it's kind of abnormal. You know, if you set you, it's, it's sort of, it feels like rocking the boat, despite the fact that um, there should be this culture of discussion at university. You know, the fact that we used to do it when I was here at the English, um, when I, was, I studied English literature, and because they were kind of lots of sort of uh, what we, some might describe as sort of fuddy-duddy old English professors, they used to love taking us to the pub to talk about stuff. And actually that was a very, in, you know, we liked it because we all wanted to get in with our lecturers, but actually now looking back at it, you think that happens less and less. There is far less of an open place for discussion. And the way you fix that is by, I think, being a little bit brave, is by saying, being like Lisa Kyo, who, um, I forget what university it was, somewhere up in Scotland, who... Aberté. Aberté, yeah, who <laughs> said, you know, a young woman student who, um, in a discussion about gender, said the incredibly normal thing of, you know, you know, it's women that have vaginas or something like that, a very standard, um, non-offensive, to my mind, viewpoint gets cancelled and gets um, threatened and that's why it's important that there are institutions like the free speech union or places that can provide practical protections for people who are you know maybe under threat of losing um, all the money for their course and stuff but I think you have to kind of find your guts and say it and that's to reject the idea that you're just here to, for, to get your, your degree that you're just here to um, even that you're you know just picking up on the point of the, the business strategy I mean, it's quite remarkable that so many universities now have sell themselves on the basis of student satisfaction and student mental health. I mean, literally, that's a trap, because what happens is, you can very easily see that a student, uh, Arif was talking to us beforehand about Jordan Peterson coming to, um, camp, to Cambridge campus. Now, whatever you think about that guy, and I'm not too impressed with what he comes out with, you have students who can, li who can quite confidently say, the presence of this person on campus threatens my mental health, and then you have a duty as university administration, you said you cared about my mental health, well here I am telling you that it's in danger, ban that guy. And you have lecturers um, spending most of their time filling out uh, and getting their students to fill out student satisfaction surveys. And universities are in this bind where they've sold themselves on the basis that this is a place where you're going to feel really good. And in fact, you know, that's not what a university should be at all. Okay, that's, but then... And th this is a kind of question to, to all of you as well, because I, I'd be interested to know if all of you agree that there should be no limits to uh, speech on campus. Because if you take some of the recent examples, like um, Professor David Miller, for example, has been uh, uh, sacked recently from Bristol University. Um, he's got a, a history of anti-Semitic comments. He's got a, a history of various... Uh, he operates in an in, in, in a area where people might say of, of misinformation and so on. Um, so is, is anything, does anything go on campus? Is, is anything okay? I mean, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. But let's take another round of questions. So I'm going to start at the front here, and then I'm going to come back and round there. Yeah. yeah it's not really a question. I mean, I was, so I was an academic for 20 years and only left you know, a couple of years ago from the University of Kent. And... Um, I think what the reason why I'm reconciled to the higher education bill as one raft of a multiple approach to academic freedom and freedom of speech, more, much more broadly, is that I think the university sector needs to be reminded that academic freedom is their central purpose. That's why they exist, and so, and yet amongst academics there's, bec there's been created a very comfortable cosy world for people as long as you share a certain set of political kind of views and I, you know, that's what I was in family sociology and it was, it was a total monoculture um, well that's the way it appeared because anybody who didn't agree just didn't say anything <laughs> and you know, I remember when Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party being in an academic seminar uh, conference and everybody was just saying, oh, it's Jeremy this, Jeremy that, now, isn't it amazing? And, and their assumption was that everybody agreed. It wasn't just that you know, they felt free to express their view, but they really did assume that everybody else would share that view. And I know that they also want, stu want students to share their view. So they therefore do end up abusing their position in the classroom, I think. 
I don't know if classroom's not the right word, in the seminar room or the lecture hall. And so you have this blurring of boundaries where their purpose, which is actually to get students to read and think, has been lost amongst their, their other view of, them, of their role in life, which is not an academic role, it's that their role is to improve the world, as they see it, which becomes then about you know, making sure that more students from disadvantaged groups come to university, making sure those students feel safe and validated when they're there. Um, and so the actual purpose gets lost um, co compared to everything else. So anything, I think, which refocuses the purpose of the university in, in, in academics' minds, in the public minds, in student minds, is, is, is I'm prepared to back it. I think it's a good thing. It's, it's not just individual academics, it's like university corporations as a yeah. whole. My university thinks of itself as an anti-racist university. Yes, it's not exactly. a place people learn things, it's yeah. anti-racist. Yeah. Okay, so um, right at the back, uh, then we'll come to here and then to you. Yes. So this is uh, really actually to the misinformation, the misinformation question as well as uh, uh, I was a journalist for a year before coming here and studying uh, media industries and uh, one thing I think that has gone wrong with a lot of journalism in, in recent years is they conflated the idea of liberal democracy of protecting liberal democracy with truth itself, where there are some issues where, like, maybe it's true that, like, let's say, like, authoritarian governments would be able to get things done faster. That doesn't make it good. That's a moral judgment. I don't think that makes them good. But that's, like, just a factual thing. And you saw, or it could be a factual thing in some instances. And you saw a lot of this with, like, Trump and a few things like that, where there was the desire to Basically, in order to protect liberal democracy, we need to like kind of redefine truth. Do you think that the conflation of truth the, and the idea of truth with liberal democracy or liberal values, progressive values, is really one of the issues that's kind of affecting universities also? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, okay, well, uh, first of all, thank you for coming, and I'd like to apologize for the very long-winded question I'm about to ask. Uh, so, firstly, in light of the stock situation, should it be right the onus to be on students to fix freedom of speech, especially given that university, as you mentioned, uh, is for many people the route to careers which could be jeopardised? And I totally agree with what you made about the commercialisation of higher education and how everyone's basically just going into it to get a job. Um, I, I think that's a separate issue which should be addressed. In universities at the minute, thanks to a survey by the uh, Central Policy Exchange or something like that, um, there was a question on a poll about whether academics refrain from airing views and teaching and research. What I found quite shocking about the uh, results from this is that the amount that 15% of people who were centrist said that they felt scared, as opposed to 15% of communists. So on new, in universities, people with very sort of mundane, run-of-the-mill opinions, um, I believe I forget who mentioned this, someone who said the everyday opinion that, that, that women have vaginas and men have penises is now something which is a taboo. Um, I find that pretty striking, and that uh, goes to my last point. Um, and secondly, it's more of a defense about the higher education level. Um, I accept that it's very limited. However, does it not have value in that it provides statutory guidance for interpretation of the European Convention uh, on Human Rights, the court surrounding the freedom of speech? surrounding issues of freedom of speech to say that it is very important that it should trump the people's rights not to be offended uh, and rights not to be, I don't know, um, offended. Uh, also, my final question, uh, well, general observation is that I think if one of the interesting things about the bill is that it mentions that um, universities can censor freedom of speech through negligence, so I think What's good about the bill is it will hopefully prevent things like the stock situation from happening, which was the result of Sussex for years uh, empowering the students to engage in activity like that. Thank you. But are students not allowed to engage in, in oh, protests? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, of course they're allowed to do that. But, um, um, or encouraged, but even. They, I don't think that the harass target harassment that went on, for example, putting out posters in the toilets that they use and stuff like that. And, other um, other such things was um, good. I think the universities have been empowered very radical students to do that. 
Okay. There's a question in there as to where where, where harassment becomes uh, something that should be uh, you know legally uh, curtailed. That is a very thin line at times. Um, let's have one more here. Then we'll come back and get a few comments, and then out for one last round of questions. So yes. Yeah. <coughs> so I came to the United Kingdom to study and to go to uh, and to go to university here. And essentially, what I found out is that um, while reading the work of Christopher Lush, especially culture of narcissism, he describes that uh, personality types uh, that enter academia or like pretty much any professional field, they long for an authoritarian uh, type to essentially validate their opinions and validate their um, personalities. And that taps into the therapeutic culture. And so all I, all I would say is that when I arrived, I was very struck by the fact that all academics that I encountered were, were stuck for um, validation and also were very insecure of their own position. Because it's like this, this thing that we've been discussing about narrowing uh, your um, your speech to the era of expertise also like causes uh, lots of neuroticism, and so I could not go to class and respect people that clearly have like mental health issues themselves, probably for the um, as a result of uh, the commercial commercialization of the university, but also uh, the fact that their narrow expertise did not offer a larger window and a broader spectrum of tools to essentially build their own confidence as a human being. And so I was wondering whether you, you could all comment on, on perhaps the need to reintroduce a broader curricula that is mandatory for everyone to acquire certain basic tools to again, to again discuss like debating and so on. Okay. okay. Um, Ella, let's come to you uh, first this time. You, any, anything that you want to pick up on, just yeah. Well, just that. on that last point about abroad. I mean, I don't know about instituting a mandatory um, curriculum. I mean, when I studied in first year, we all had to do a course on critical thinking, and it was not that didn't particularly help me in relation to critical thinking. What helped me was being involved in politics outside of the university. Um, but I think we did a lot of Judith Butler, so that'll tell you about what that course <laughs> involved in relation to critical thinking. But there is, I think, a problem more broadly with the fact that you, you know, and Dennis and Erica both comment on this, on an education system more broadly, which is that I think lot, increasingly students are entering into their first year and, and really being coming, it's like stepping off another planet into an alien world of a university where you no longer are in a space where a teacher says and you write down and that's what you, and that, that's how education works. You, I think so much of a secondary school education now is about just funneling kids with um, information in a way that when you then get asked what your opinion is in, the, in your first class of first year, I, mean, I remember it being a kind of completely overwhelming and horrendous and I didn't, you know, you di didn't want to say what your opinion was because you had never really been asked that. I think that is part of a problem, but I mean, just linking, not to get too hung up on the higher education bill, I think that the part of the question is where the power lies in a university and why university education is meant to be different from secondary school education. Because there's, you know, in as much as I think it is a problem that academics um, have political biases, and obviously I, you know, mentioned Brexit because. Uh, you know, the, there was a very real fact that people, you know, university lecturers who supported um, a leave position felt like they couldn't speak up or they'd lose their job or lose their friends, and that's a very bad thing. But I think it's a rather infantile idea that that's, that's at least some students have that you uh, that that your lecturers or your or professors are just these impenetrable experts that you can never question. I mean, maybe I was just an annoying student, but I would relish the, the idea of saying you're wrong in my seminars. Um, even if, that, and, that, and that's not to be silly and, and disrespect the power and knowledge and expertise of someone who has spent 5, 10, 20 years of their life studying this one book. But is I could go along to, I used to do early modern studies, and go along and listen to my professors going on about, um, you know, the, you know, Shakespeare and all people like that, and I would uh, listen to them and then understand these individuals as people who had their own political biases. I knew them outside of my classroom. I knew which way they voted. I knew which, you know, what they said in other places. I read some of their other books. And so I think, okay, 
I know that you're coming to this, I know what you say about this text, I also know what you think about the world, and now I'm going to make my own decision about whether or not I think you're being influenced or not. I think it's perfectly possible that you could go to a lecture with someone and hear them talk about something, and you can politically disagree with them, whether it be on Brexit lines, whether it be on gender lines, and understand that you can pick and choose what you get from a university education. That students don't aren't sponges that have to suck up everything from their um, act from their lecturers and professors. In that way, I think there has to be a reassessment of where what a university is made up of, because it is not made up of academics and students. There, I think that's part of the problem with. The students have to, the, the move towards becoming a business. It's just like you are two completely different sectors. It is a, not to sound like kumbaya, Alistair, but it's like you know a mixing of one can't exist without the other. And you, if you're a good academic, you'll welcome your students saying to you, well, I think you're wrong on this, and that's what a debate is. Um, and if you're a bad academic, and you're, or if you're a bad student, you'll be hostile to having that discussion. Okay, and Arif, again, pick up on anything you want, but just in this, yeah. this kind of the need for a, a kind of cultural bottom-up assertion of, yeah. of, of freedom is quite interesting. I mean, the, the, the question there was um, why should students, why should the onus on students be to pursue free speech? And in a way, you might turn that round and say, well, surely it's students that have the most benefit from free speech. And does then the, the kind of legal, legalistic approach and the, the kind of top-down approach actually inculcate a, a more a culture of reliance on someone else to hand us something down? Yeah, I think, I mean, with the issue about, about students, I and mean, the problem is, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine to say, you know, they should be a bit more brave, but where's the incentive to be brave? If you, if, you, if you say something that could possibly get you into trouble on Twitter, and it's going to be there forever, and when you apply to Goldman Sachs, and the person who's looking at the applications has 500 applications in this pile, he'll, the first thing he sees is a slight risk of a candidate that application is going to be a bit. So where, where's your incentive? To do that is not a problem that legislation can fix. It's a deep problem. Oh, I don't know how to fix it. But so, so, no, the incentive is not on, on students. Um, I did want to pick up on a few other things. Um, yeah. There was one, one very good point about, about um, this conflation between facts and values, but also this idea in liberal democracy that somehow if you've got these right values and these right ideas about how countries should be run, that gives you the right somehow to suppress information. And we even saw this, the, the President Biden spokes, spokeswoman said recently that they were flagging to Facebook, whoever, misinformation. These towns, they should be told the fuck off because this is not the People's Republic of China. And they can't, the government can't tell Facebook or anyone else what they should and shouldn't be saying. Um, so I think that, that's terrifying. Um, just I mean, one more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Get out well, just, just briefly, I mean, I think on the, on the point of, of, about um, privatisation, which you raised, I think that's right, but we don't actually have the guidance. The bill has not yet given us guidance. We would need it because there is a conflict between what the bill asserts, so there may be, and what the Equality Act 2010 says. The Equality Act 2010, which is the one that's saying, you know, you've got a right not to have a, an offensive or hostile atmosphere created. And what would be really helpful, if anything is going to be helpful from a top of the point of view, the guidance saying, at a university, whenever these things come into conflict, intellectual freedom or freedom of speech always comes first. That would be, that would be really helpful. Okay, so useful to know if you all agree with that. I'm going to come out for one, I'm going to take Dennis, cut, then come out for one more quick round of questions. So have your uh, questions ready when I come out. Dennis, anything that you could Just want two to points. Point one on. on the bill. I mean, we're not in the position of the founding fathers of the American and the Republic. You know, we're not writing a new constitution. And the Second Amendment is a brilliant amendment. You know, Congress will make no laws abridging the freedom of the press and freedom of speech. But that hasn't worked. It's still being battled on now. Right? There's, there's a big battle. But here, it's a different issue. You know, it's because it's already failed. The free speech has already failed. And pe people promoting this, I don't mean John or Arif, but a lot of people behind it have given up on academics, completely given up on them. You can just see consciously, and some of them admit it openly, that they need legislation. But if you get somebody to legislate, it doesn't make you free. You can't be legislated into freedom and free speech. You know, that's servility. You know, you're still servile to the state in that sense. I think that, that's my take on it, because it's a battle that you've got to have and you can't have it um, through legislation. Because what will happen, just, I won't go on too long, but I'll just say, if ever, and I deal loads of times with cases, and often students, I do two or three this week, and where there is criticism, the students don't say anything in class, but then put in a complaint that this really offended me and emotionally upset me. And people get, and you believe, and you know, I can give you the examples off record, where um, people get suspended for gross misconduct for the use of a metaphor. 
or just you doing ordinary teaching if students said they were offended and hurt by it anonymously. So there is a sort of criticism that goes on. On the second point, I'll just say, I don't... The <coughs> universities becoming politicised is a function of the therapeutic culture. It's not just that they've de adapted left-wing politics, you know, that Eric Coltsman's view, they've all become left-wing, which is, you know, there is something to that. But they've become left-wing on, the, on defence of victims. You know, so they're fighting racism, they're fighting for, for trans rights, fighting it. So that's the, that's the underlying support, and it makes you powerful if you're defending a victim. That's the power behind it. I can't, you know, I don't believe for a second that all university management have become you know, left wing. But that's just not the case. But they just think it's the right way to behave, and that you know, it's well intentioned, but um, th thought light approach. Okay, so final round of questions. I'm going to start here, then there, then there, and then I'll, I'll come back to you just for a sort of couple of minutes of closing thoughts. One thing you might want to reflect on, actually, in your closing remarks, is what would a free speech university look like, and is it a good thing? I mean, this Austin initiative is, 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 is quite interesting. So, yes? So I'm hearing a lot about trying to create solutions to this problem. Do you think the solution is to actually change um, how university operates? Or just create a new institution that would be like universities, say, 100 years ago, or 60 years ago, or whenever. Okay. What do you think is the best option there? Okay, so that is the kind of Austin uh, question. Yes? Uh, yeah, so just to sort of well, reiterate another point from Lash, in fact, which Jen's pleased about, but um, the, I think that the ideas we're going through here are a bit to do with, on the one hand, democracy in a very, in as Lash would see it, what we call the democratization of competence which is that the idea of a properly throwing democracy is that you have a lot of citizens who all are competent and knowledgeable and can have debate with each other about different things. And even though you might not be a professional in one particular subject, you can still inform yourself and you can still make points in a debate, even if you know, you, there's, there's no, no one is excluded from the hierarchy of, of authority to be able to speak on any particular subject. Whereas what we have at the moment um, at the... David Starkey gave a very good uh, speech at the SDP conference recently about the, the nature of the professional classes as they are, they are all modelled on the clerisy. And what that means is that they're very, they appeal to authority in their very nature, in that basically what, is, what can be known in these professions is a matter of, of hierarchy. Um, and so the problem is, as we face, I think, is that instead of this very thriving democratic culture where everyone can have an opinion of anything, we have we have the experts, and only the experts can say what they think, um, and that is well, it, it covers much of our people. Um, but that is, well, yes, anyway, that, that's the problem I, I think is. But then, is the university not based on the authority of expertise? Well, I'd say it's based on the, but not unconditional authority. I think authority is very weak. In fact, it can't be questioned. Uh, I think that's the problem that many. Universities have is that oh well these are the experts we can just talk about you know that they're the only people that can speak but it's not authority is authority because they can stand up being questioned by anyone and still be there whereas currently the it's the narcissistic way of thinking about authority and expertise is actually very brittle because it can't be questioned by ordinary people. Okay, good. Um, yes. Is there any more, by the way? Any any, any other final questions? No, oh, sorry. Yeah, yes. so uh, I guess on we'll start with yeah, Jan's point about the higher education bill uh, maybe stopping academics from abusing their position in, in seminars you know, with their political biases, that may help solve it, but I think there's a bigger problem maybe, and that's the reading list. Um, the reading lists, um, you know, it may stop them. The higher, I may not know enough about the higher education bill, but from my understanding, it may not. It doesn't really solve the reading list problem because academics can can you know take and encourage students in direction with the reading lists. You know, for instance, I study history, and I've seen plenty of reading lists that have Howard Zinn on it, but never with you know Neil Ferguson on you know. And you know, so would the higher education bill really solve that that issue and that soft influence that is at play in in, in higher education? And on uh, Alice's point about Catherine Stock and the outside perception of you know, I think you said maybe I didn't quote you directly, but like you said that the to the outside perception, it's 
a lot of people think what's happened to cattle and stock is disgusting and disgraceful. I'm not sure that's the tr that's entirely true because you know, Kathleen Stock I think went on Lorraine Kelly's show um, and you know and Kelly was I watched clips of it and she was she she Lorraine Kelly towards Kathleen Stock was saying things like you've not been cancelled you you know you, you you know there's you know what did really kind of like such students do wrong um, so I I, I, I don't. I don't think there is this, and I went on the podcast at my university, and they were saying that well, she made. She, they were saying that Kathleen Stock, well, they made Kathleen Stock made trans students or some trans students feel uncomfortable, and maybe was creating this hostile environment towards the hands of trans students on the university. So, you know, do does she have a right to have a platform, and don't they if if it's creating this uncomfortable environment for? trans students on the University of Sussex, don't they? The University of Sussex have a, have a responsibility to protect um, okay. them, yeah. All right, Matthew, I'm taking it that given we started five minutes late, we can just run a little yeah, bit yeah, over, because there's a few hands now. I mean, on the reading list thing, I, I kind of, is, is there a more fundamental sort of academic freedom question there? Because surely, uh, if, if the authority of the academic is to be respected and has academic freedom, then they have the right to choose reading lists. Is that not part of it? So the, 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 the complaining that they've not got your books on is, is kind of seems like a, a contradiction in, in, in the terms of academic freedom. But yes, uh, yes. Um, yeah, I'm really interested in why free speech is so associated with right-wing people and it's become like a project of the right. And if I mention that I'm involved in free speech politics amongst my left-wing friends, they will start to look shifty and weird, like they cannot understand yes. that somebody can still be left-wing um, and also be really interested in free speech. And to me, free speech sh should speak to so many left-wing values, really. Um, and historically, it's been used to help uplift the marginalised people and stuff. So I'm not saying free speech should now be run by a bunch of lefties either. But why is it why is it failing to appeal to the left? Why are the left rejecting free speech? Very good question. Um, so there's two people that have already spoken that want to speak again. So just yeah, no, you've got to keep it quick though. Yeah, no, so right at the back no, no, and then no. at the front. Um, of course one of the things with the past year we've seen is the rise of kind of the digital school like the Zoom or Teams or a platform people are using and of course when you think of like a video game, you can get like hurt in a video game. Your character can be attacked by other characters, you can lose hit points. When everything's kind of moved online, is there a danger that it's even more like, it's even easier for people to claim that like speech equals violence or something like that because everything's interacting with the computer anyway. So like, you can say, oh, well you did the equivalent of punching me by like physically attacking, verbally attacking the words using the digital move to the online digital make this problem of people claiming that speech is actually violence worse. Okay, so is it a problem of online stuff? Um, yes, and yeah, finally... Just, so just I just want to clarify what I mean, because I don't, I, I think bias is a bullshit term, and I think people, you know, make, students are increasingly making the claim that they want unbiased education, so I didn't even sort of witch hunt out the bias in any situation, and I, I, I you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a not a helpful term. It's people do the same thing with the BBC, and it's going on all over the place. This bullshit idea that there's something there's something that exists unbiased. What I meant was that academics. It's not that they're airing their political views in the in the seminar room and the lecture hall because it, it, our political views are embedded in our work that we do. That's why you study one thing rather than another very often. It's because of your wider set of beliefs about the world. And I think that's absolutely fine. But I, I, what I'm describing is academics who do not think the purpose of their role is to get all ideas out on the table to be explored and discussed and, and worked against one another. They actually want to shape the values of the students in the room while they're in the room with them. So they're abusing, they are abusing their position, not by saying what they think, but by trying to shape what the students are allowed to think about, and, and, and they end up then sort of short, short, um, short circuiting the process by. And I know academics do this, where they spend much of their time in the, with first years tidying up the language that first years use, because you know, when you, especially if you have like working class students coming in, like we do in Kent, my colleagues would be tidying up the words they used uh, and the vocabulary that they that the students would spontaneously use in order to talk about certain issues because they they don't like certain words. 
And by the time, as an academic like me, would be trying to discuss uh, issues with students, and they're completely tongue-tied, because they know they're not supposed to say certain, certain the words they would naturally use to discuss uh, you know, issues and problems and questions. So it is an, it is an abuse of the position. But not, it's not because they're of the left, it's a, it's a misunderstanding of what, of what academic life is supposed to be about. Okay, so there's loads of questions there. You're not going to be able to answer them all uh, on, on this panel, but obviously there's two uh, sessions to follow where uh, there's lots of opportunity to look at some of these issues that have come up in a bit greater depth. But just, um, do you want to just give us kind of closing, some quick closing thoughts, pick up on anything you want or, or even just give us something to uh, take away with us? Well, all, the, all great questions came at the end. I just said that it's the business of words being violence. That um, shouting fire in the clouded um, theatre, pressing a fire alarm in a crowded theatre, is that free speech? Like the same. It's not a, a legitimate analogy. You know, questions about, um, um, you know, I, I don't think students are stupid. I know a lot of, of students that I know don't like what their lecturers say and sometimes disagree. Even if they're quiet, they disagree. And, you know, so I don't think that that's the case. And so the Brexit example is a very good one because they were basically, they were castigated as racist and thick by their lecturers that's, and their parents. That was a, a horrible moment. And then that's where students begin to realise that something was going on that's political, but they can cope with that, I think. That's the, thing. the only thing I'm going to say at the end of this is if you really want to understand the debate, as, as we're going through the debate, and it always is, if you read Plato's Protagoras, and if those of you are doing classics, the Stephanus numbers, I think I'm right, it's 334 to 338. There's a great debate in here, in the middle of the dialogue, um, about whether um, Socrates and Protagoras should go on as experts having the debate. And basically they throw the rattle out of the pram, then there becomes a debate with everybody else about what should happen in terms of debates, about philosophy and debates. But they come to the conclusion that the debate is not for the experts, it's for, it's for the policy, it's for everybody. So it should happen in a public place. And so if you read that, it's a really good and example. It's exactly the sort of thing that Lash is saying. But yeah, it's there in the Plato, so um, a bit of bedtime reading. It's very easy to read as well. It's a very nice section for them. But, so I recommend that if you really want to understand why speech shouldn't be in little groups, but it should be in a public sphere. Good. An event that you go away with a reading list from. <laughs> um, <my> reading. Aaron. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just pick up on a couple of points. I mean, well, on the point of Kathleen Stock, of course, she, she wasn't cancelled. Nobody shows she was cancelled. What they're saying is she was harassed and victimised. Mm. That's what happened. There's no doubt about that. It's you. Sussex admitted that. That was wrong. That was disgraceful. On the point about the connection between the left and or the left versus the right and free speech, it is interesting. Um, I think what's changed is not free speech. I think it's the left that's changed. The left has become more intolerant, and people who are on the left, who are in favour of free speech, get disowned by the left. So, for instance, my own union, the UCU, which I've now left, you know, I was an activist in it for, for 15 years. Colleagues who was an old-fashioned socialist, so I'm not, but who were, have also left, and now they're they're regarded as being on the right. Because there, you know, there's a, there a college porter in Cambridge, you know, who was a, a, a councillor, who was, a, I think, Lib Dem, but he was on the left. Um, and he's now regarded as some kind of fascist. So part of it is that the left has changed, not that free speech has changed. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Sure. Ella, your final thoughts. Yeah, just on, not that I want to pick on you about the issue of reading lists, but the thing that's interesting about that is, well, obviously there's a point that Alistair made about an academic, academic freedom is about being able to set your reading list, even if the reading list is shy. But it's also the, the question, you know, the question I'd ask to that is, why are students coming to university, it's part of the problem with secondary school education perhaps, or, you know, why are students coming to a university, if you come and you take a reading list and that's all that you read, and that's all you engage with, you're doing it wrong. And I think that a good academic will encourage you to read beyond it, just, and will say, here's my expertise, but I mean, if you want to read this other book, come and talk to me about it and any good academic will have read wider than their, the reading list they're suggesting and so there's you know the, but it seems like a small point but the quest that's what I'm talking about the question about an expansion away from what your university degree and what your university experience offers you which is that it's you know there is the, the kind of basic point if you come here to study physics or you come here to study literature and you want to know more about that subject and you want to have information that you, you, you know you want to learn like I did study one sentence for a whole class you want to get right down into the the depth of knowledge and information but also the other part of a university experience is that you find out who and I've mentioned this you find out not who you are in a like la di da I'm a nice person kind of therapeutic way, 
but you find out what you think about the world. So the very specific thing that you learnt about this subject makes you question the way in which you live, the way in which you interact with others. And I think that, you know, the problem with the left-right issue, and it is frustrating, and I think, you know, I think sometimes we have to get a little bit, the people throw around the term, you know, lots of people on the right who I know say, oh, well, you're just a liberal lefty. And it's like, that's as superficial as people on the left say, oh, well, you're just a right-wing freeze peacher. Um, but there is a, I think the broader issue is not a left and right thing anymore, but whether you're a Democrat or an undemocrat. And I think this is why I, uh, you know, I think there should be further discussions about the higher education bill because it's very interesting. But the fundamental reason why I am against it is because as someone who believes that um, uh, power and knowledge and decision making doesn't come from state legislated or, um, or state allowed provisions and the basis of bills or otherwise, but it is from a fundamental belief um, that the polis makes society and should hold the power in society and should set the agenda and that the experts um, have their role in that and inform us and as Dennis mentioned in the kind of debate information playoff that Lash talks about, but that's part of it. But fundamentally the issue is do you think that uh, your average Joe who either ends up attending university or doesn't has an ability to handle ideas, to talk about ideas, without the, um, the green light or indeed without restriction from the state. And if you do, then you're, you're in favour of democracy and you understand that free speech is a bottom-up thing. And if you don't, then I think you don't really know what free speech is about. Brilliant. Can we thank all the panel, please? So the deal is that you don't necessarily go away with all the answers, but hopefully you go away with a few more questions and the ability to make up your own minds about what the answers might be. So this is not, you know, they're not handing down the scriptures on what's right or what's wrong, but they're hopefully giving you the ability to think through the questions at a deeper level and, and, and to help make up your own minds. And hopefully the two sessions that follow are, are, are going to continue to help that. So, Matthew, what, um, yes. what should we do? So, um, I think we should first of all give another round of applause for our brilliant panel. Um, and then now we're going to, Luke is going to lead everybody over to Jubilee 115, which is a seminar room. Uh, we've got tables set up of kind of just six or so people. Um, so try and find a group, try and mix it up to chat with people you don't know. And there should be at least or roughly kind of one person, probably dressed in a white hoodie, but not all of them, um, to kind of just make sure everything goes well. And then we'll uh, brief you on that once we're in.